Thanks for everyone for joining us. Uh, we are glad to be here. Thank you to South by Southwest for allowing us to host this panel during the 2021 online festival. I would like you to imagine yourself right now in Austin, Texas for a moment. And just outside the door, we have about half a million people trying to get into this panel to hear from these stories, from these experiences. And uh, Mark Cuban is walking down the street. Kamala Harris is doing her thing and uh, tons of activity. And then later after this panel, we go to one of those uh, amazing bands that just showed up from somewhere so far away on this planet. And that's what a convergence is. When I wanted to uh, put this panel together with my friends, I was thinking about South by Southwest. I was thinking about my own experiences there, but also my own experiences as a third culture kid who's a serial immigrant and who also has a visual disability. So, and I wanted to invite people that are not from different experiences in terms of their backgrounds and, and thoughts and so forth, but also that are uh, brave enough to try different technologies and different experiences of technologies. So um, please enjoy the next uh, few, uh, about an hour and um, get ready. The first 25 minutes will be slowly rising towards uh, something that's surprising. And after 25 minutes, uh, it's gonna get sort of dirty. Put yourself some cup of tea, get some Doritos, um, tacos, whatever you want, and enjoy the show. The importance of bridging cultures, both within America and across the borders, have never been greater than it is today. Rapid changes in information technology has brought the world's peoples into more direct contact than ever before. But mere proximity, actual or virtual, does not guarantee understanding. In fact, we are seeing more and more amplified opposing views. The vitality of our democracy depends on a grasp of the historical and cultural forces that shape our nation and world. I ask myself every day, why bridging cultures and why now? Why not amplifying our own voices, but give opportunity to inclusion of thoughts from intersectional experiences? And why storytellers, creators of IPs, should think about algorithms and curation during the design of their narratives, the design of the worldviews they create that have a ripple effect in our society and our children of the future. If we accept that narratives are manuals on how to function in life, then we should pay some attention to this. Thank you for having us. This is exciting. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, it's great to be here. Each of you has done significant work across various communities you inhabit. Ainsley recently created Forange, which translates as foreigner in Amharic, a graphic memoir in VR exploring the idea of home and the divide between being Ethiopian, but also from Cleveland and more as a woman of color and more. Elegance, you've recently made the Peer Kids and several other great projects based on your personal experiences as well. Uh, being homeless, being a black gay man from the queer community, advocating for your community. Ashley, you've been a vulnerability advocate both in your speaking engagements and in the stories you've been directing, writing, producing, including the short single that I've had a pleasure seeing last year, breaking stereotypes of preconceived notions of living life with a disability. I wish we could have more people, by the way, in this panel from different walks of life, but even having four of us is, uh, is going to be very condensed and perhaps the next one will have uh, a larger group. So I wanna ask you this, uh, what made each of, of you wanna become a storyteller? I really, I really wanna know that. And why you chose the medium you chose? My background is not actually visual. I studied philosophy and French in school. And then I ended up um, actually being really inspired by a lot of emerging Ethiopian photographers back when I was living in Addis. Um, and I was working on this thing called the Addis Photo Fest. And I really got to see these self-taught photographers sort of communicating their experience of their hometown, their story of Ethiopia um, through their own images. And I started to really get into this idea of being interested in using a visual medium to um, communicate stories. And that was my first, like my really, uh, one of the exposures to it that uh, really inspired me. And then later on, um, my first experience, Ferenc, I ended up making that um, as a VR experience because at the time that honestly felt like the most accessible medium. Um, it was just a couple years ago and um, I was in a program um, doing um, fiction and entertainment and I couldn't actually travel to the different locations where I wanted to um, shoot or to capture um, 
the different frag the different fragments of my story. So um, in Ferenc, it was actually it made more sense to crowdsource the imagery um, and to create these 3D scans. Um, they're basically like 3D photographs, and to ask family and friends in Cleveland in Addis Ababa to send them to me um, to process and to um, sort of use 3D tools that I was learning at the at the program that I was in at the time. So honestly, I, I went into that program thinking I was going to make a traditional uh, film, but I ended up making this VR experience because it was um, I mean, I was drawn to the medium. I, we can get more into that later as well. Um, but the idea of these point clouds, these 3D memories, um, just when I was playing around with them, they looked best in, uh, in an immersive environment when you could travel through them um, and experience them from, you know, from up close and from far away and see how they go from being distinct to being abstract. I actually experienced it in VR as well. I know you can watch it on YouTube as well, but I was certainly, I felt like I was there. And, and really interestingly enough, uh, for those people that haven't seen it, um, you know, it's, it's you narrating. You're the narrator, right? Unless yeah, 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 yeah. Voices of other people in it uh, that have op opposing views or questions about your culture uh, and so forth. I really felt like I was there and, you know, following your story, inexperienced, not watching from far away, but being there. It was very inspiring. Thank you. Yeah, I am the narrator. And um, there are fragments of voices that are from phone calls, like from my parents that I um, recorded there. It's like a hybrid docu fiction, um, surreal dreamscape. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I kind of came to filmmaking by way of a happy accident. I had spent 10 years of my life homeless and then um, you know, I, I got into a shelter and, you know, things were pretty desperate. So I called my mother up to ask if I can come home. And she was like, well, are you still gay? And I'm like, well, yeah, of course I am. And she's like, well, you can't come home, but maybe you should join the military. And this is in 2005. So this is like Iraq war, troop surge, you know, people are being blown up on the side of the road. So I kind of took it very personally. I was, it was almost as if she was saying, you know, I would rather you blown up than be gay. So, I refused to do it. And then I went back to the shelter and looked around and kind of saw a bunch of other men who had been in that situation of life for much longer than I had been and kind of leveled up myself and be like, is this my future? Is this really what I want to do? So of course the answer was no. I went to the recruiter after giving me the entrance exam. It's, like, it's called an ASVAB. So it's a placement test that determines which jobs you do in the military. I scored very highly on it and the recruiter kind of crossed off the top three jobs out of a list of probably 15,000 jobs and said, don't look below this line. So the number one job was intelligence and I'm nobody snitch. So I didn't do that. And the second job was journalism and I'm too biased to be a good journalist. And the other job was filmmaking. And I was like, you know, they had this picture of this Marine hanging outside, upside down from a helicopter with like a telephoto lens. And I was like, yeah, that, I could do that. And interestingly enough, prior to this moment, I was to survive. One of my hustles was to steal art books. So for years I had stolen all these books, you know, by Pedro Almodovar and Spike Lee and uh, Mike Lee and Ang Lee, all the Lees um, and uh, many others. So when he asked me if I'd ever thought about being a filmmaker, my recruiter, I kind of had a vague idea of what that life was like. And at times had fantasized what it would be like to be a director. So I'm like, of course I want to be a filmmaker. Yeah, sure, sign me up. And then it wasn't until I got to my duty station and my job was to make documentaries for the Marines and everything from like actuality films of how weapons work to retirement ceremonies um things like that so i had this general call me to his office and i was terrified because his office was like dr strange love a little bit so ex except in his version of having the world map in his office he had his personal logo over all over the pacific region so i was terrified i'm like why does this man want to talk to me I, i'm nobody what did i do wrong and then he kind of shows me his script for his retirement ceremony and he was like um what do you think of this, Bratton? Would you, would, is this how you would do it if you were retiring? And I, 
And it stunned me because it was the first time like a straight white man had ever asked me what I thought about anything. So I was like, um, why is he asking me this, you know? And it turned out he thought I was a film director. So it kind of stuck with me. I was like, wow, this is a job I can do where people listen to me. So um, fast forward five years and I'm starting at Columbia University after many years spent homeless. And I'm looking around at these fellow students who are going home at the end of the semester and kind of asking myself like, what is that for me? Who's, wait who's eagerly awaiting my return? And I kind of look up one day and I'm on Christopher Street Pier in the West Village. And, you know, at Columbia, I'm, I, I, the culture shock of it all of like, you know, 10 years prior in a homeless shelter. Now I'm at an Ivy League university, you know, studying with the children of the leaders of the world, right? The, the top 1%, many of them. So, you know, when you're in that environment, a person like me, and you're around like people who have capital, not even wealth, right? People who have money's money, you know? you start to look at yourself and ask yourself, what is that for me too? Like, what is my capital? What is the thing that I can wield better than anyone else in the world that people can come back to me for? And so I'm thinking about home and I'm trying to figure out what my power is. And I end up um, buying the camera that I use in the military and going out to Christopher Street in the West Village because Christopher Street is the place that I came out at when I was 16. And, I, and it was the first time in my life back then where I felt like I had been understood. And I realized that for me, home is not necessarily a physical location, but it is the place where one is most deeply understood. And I'm like, wow, that felt like, like a cinematic thought. So I took this camera that I purchased and I shot 400 hours of footage with an intention to try to express to someone else that home is a place where one is most deeply understood. And, you know, in the military, we also learned this idea of hearts and minds, that what we did as filmmakers for the Marines had the ability to transform the way wars are fought and, you know, bring peace and all these ideas. So when it came time to expressing my own experience, I really felt like, you know, the kind of the, the price of being invisible is that people don't know how to conceive of you or how to feel for you. So I take seriously the opportunity that I have to use this medium to help others be heard and to be felt. Very inspiring. Um, I can't imagine what you have went through, but when I saw the film, uh, The Pier Kids, I was, uh, you showed me something that I've never seen before. It was very, very, um, I didn't know enough about the subject matter, I can tell you that, and I've seen a world that I've never seen before. Uh, to, I don't want to tell people what happens towards the end, but uh, as we go towards the end of the film, I, 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 I was more and more invest, invested in, You made me cry a few times, so uh, I guess thank you for that. I want to see both of your films and like these sound amazing and it's just cool to hear everyone else's journey. Um, you know, for me, growing up in high school, I was always into stories and um, I was always really into magazines and like the investigative story. And and I, I also really loved film, but I kind of pushed that aside. And I think the first film I saw that made me want to get into film was Requiem for a Dream because I never, I was 15 or 14 when I saw it, which is a little young to see something like that. But um, it really was able to open a door of empathy for, for a community that I really knew nothing about. And, I, and I, I thought that was like an incredible thing that film can do is have you walk in someone's shoes and be able to understand a whole different perspective when maybe you had different like preconceived judgments. And, you know, I was always kind of the one like, holding the camera with me and my friends. But I, you know, when I was figuring out what to go into school for, I was from Nebraska. I never thought I could see myself in Hollywood. I also have a disability. I'm small. I look different. Like I, I just was like, there's no way that I could be in that world. So I was like, you know, what? I'm going to go into journalism and be a writer and be like behind the scenes. And so I went to school for journalism. I came out to California because I have extended family in the area. And it wasn't until actually my senior year, I was about to graduate and I was taking a film minor studies and I, I really wanted to, um, I really wanted to go into film, but I was still, I just didn't see myself there. There was no way I could do this. And then I actually had a speaker come in and he had a paralyzed arm and he worked in the business as a distributor. And that was something for me where I was like, oh, they do accept people who are different in this community. And maybe I could have a career And I was gonna completely like go to grad school. I was filling out applications for, for film school. And I was like, I'll be a screenwriter. 
And um, I, I ended up like asking people if that was a good decision. And, and a lot of people said, unless you have the money up front for film grad school, don't do it because you're probably going to be broke the entire time you're trying to get, you know, a career. And I didn't have the money up front. And so I, I just started working in the business. And I've, I did that for about like 10 years of being an assistant to different people and um, for different like producers and, and worked in a writer's office. And I would start to do these jobs where like I worked in a writer's office for a TV show and I was like, I don't think I want to be a writer. <laughs> and then I work for a producer and I'm like, I don't think I want to be a producer. But I was always so visual and I was like, I could never be the director. But I decided just to shoot something and, and create like a small short. And my first short film was kind of like this self-funded small project. And I, I ended up doing it, really loving the process. And I was like, I need to work for a director. And so I, I ended up getting a job working for John Chu. And I was his assistant for two and a half years. I was on the whole Crazy Rich Asians like trajectory. My second interview was to read that book and, and tell him how I'd make it into a movie. And this entire time I was like, really, I had a lot of internalized ableism. Like I did not want to associate with my disability. I didn't even want to talk about it. I would hide it. I would wear clothes that like, you couldn't tell as much, even though if you all met me in person, you'd instantly be able to know like that I have a disability. And it was so interesting, the parallel of Crazy Rich Asians and how representation meant so much to the Asian American community. And these letters that people were sending my boss that I would get and have to pass along to him were about how seeing themselves on screen was like is transformative and you know seeing yourself represented in media somewhere is is, is it has power you know because it's how we see the world through these narratives and it I had this moment of kind of like oh my god I never see someone like me or someone dealing with a disability in a nuanced way in TV and film. And I feel like, you know, it was this, this awakening of my identity of realizing that if I would have seen someone with a disability doing, you know, the things that I was doing and like working in Malaysia and Singapore, doing all these like things and even just seeing narratives that weren't, you know, you feel bad for someone or you pity them in the storyline. And it, it, it made me just like want to start creating films that speak to disability in a really authentic way way and really disrupt the narrative instead of like safe cute sweet you know things that I was always like I don't identify with this community but then I started meeting people once I actually like opened up and and really kind of dug in I met a bunch of people that really opened my eyes to another side of disability and that more felt like um you know humanizing people it wasn't and most of the stuff made for people with disabilities or about disabilities not by people with disabilities so that's why they always get it wrong or it feels, you know, I mean, you just need that authenticity there to treat the person as a human. And so that's, you know, I, I did another short. And then the one after that was single where, where I took two people who have a disability, they end up getting set up on a blind date and it goes horribly wrong because you're trying to put two people together based on a physical attribute of your body instead of if two people have chemistry or <laughs> same, same interests and, you know, different things and kind of confronting internalized ableism and it's just been a really crazy wild journey because ever since I've kind of opened up to that side of my community and, and I've just, there's so many stories to tell because disability doesn't discriminate. It can happen to anyone in any community at any period in your life. What is it? I think the number is 20% of US population is, uh, is uh, falls under people with disability. And that's kind of broad. It's also mental illness and a lot of things, but it's one of the least mm -hmm. on, on camera and behind behind the camera as well. I identified with your film single when I watched it last year at South by uh, one, because I also go on sometimes, sometimes blind dates. So it's beyond, uh, of course, <laughs> well, and then sometimes people match you for different reasons uh, that they think is the right thing. And it's not. And, and in that level, I do connect with it. You know, and, I mean, this is obviously a question that I know a lot of people are asking, you know, can we make uh, stories of people that are not of our experiences? If we do, what kind of measurements we have to take into consideration? There's lots of untold mm -hmm. stories. And I feel like mm -hmm. today there's a revolution, both in the consumption of uh, uh, content, but also in terms of stories. There's so many great new untold stories being discovered mm -hmm. every day, you know? I just hope that we're able to reach a little bit more mainstream. That being right. said, you know, uh, we'll get into that a little later. So 
I'll just uh, go straight to the point. Uh, this is a bit more, uh, I guess, uh, you know, a little dirty, let's say. Um, <laughs> so you're all from different underrepresented groups for, you know, with different aspects. So what are the largest misconceptions about your own communities that you'd wish people outside of your own community knew? What drives me crazy is like the black version of the white thing. Yeah. That drives me crazy. Like, oh, it's the black miracle on 34th street or it's like, you know, the black Brady bunch or whatever. whatever. I, that would be great actually, but you know, <laughs> they don't seem to make those. Um, you know, that, that idea that, okay, we need to have an equivalent black film or like queer film for every heterosexual type of film that ignored us, that whole scorecard mentality around like racism and representation, I think is just, it just oversimplifies everything and it takes the eye off of the prize, which is that spit, that pivot, that, that little spigot where the money comes from. The people who are sitting in charge of that spigot have, they don't get challenged to necessarily think beyond the thing that already made money so that you end up with a solution of diversity that's just like, okay, we'll do the disabled version of the Nutcracker. We should do the disabled version. You know, I'm not saying not to do that, but at the same time though, if that's all we're doing, we're not really fixing anything. We're not really actually thinking about fixing anything. So, so no, I don't think of myself as like rebutting any sort of like, you know, white supremacist notions of like who I am and the people I come from. What I am doing is asserting my right to exist and to say what I want to say about my experience in the same marketplace that, you know, the Sean's and the Ryan's and the Bob's and the John's have been occupying, you know, like the film industry itself, it's 120 years old, something like that. And Oscar So White is 2014. And like, you know, the disability conversation, it, it, we could talk about when does it really start to happen in mainstream Hollywood, the immigrant experience being kind of prioritized, but we know that it's much less than 120 years of this medium. So if, so if, you, if you're telling me the version of justice is to say, okay, everything that was done for 120 years, we need to have a black version of it. I don't think that's justice. I think it's just kind of reinstituting more of the same. To me, justice is a diversity of perspectives. Nobody is a monolith. There's not one way to be black, there's not one way to be Ethiopian, there's not one way to express disability. So we need to, so these people who control the money need to be braver than they are and do better than they're doing, telling the story of our civilization. I think with disability, like, I think the big thing that I'm always trying to tell people is there is no box for disability. Like I've been in a Hollywood lab where it's people who are coming up in all different areas. And in this room was people with depression who have, that's their disability. And then there's people who are paraplegic and communicate with a tablet and are wheelchair users. You know, it's like, and then I'm somewhere in the middle there. And it's like, it's such a vast spectrum of humanity. And it is that no disabled person is just like, it's like having brown hair. You know, it's, it's this element where, yeah, we, we can connect over it, but it's such different experiences. So it, it is that thing where you just need so many different voices and different perspectives. Like I'm only going to tell a very narrow perspective of my disabled existence, you know, and we need so many other voices to put, you know, their creative perspective in there as well. So I, I guess I want to bring it down to um, the personal level in Ferenc. Um So this combating the white gaze was one of the most uh, annoying challenges that kept popping up along the way in the process of making it and the process of writing the script because that was something that um, I did not want to do. I just wanted to present as Elegance was saying, like my own reality or my own truth and to sort of put that out into the universe because I hadn't really seen it uh, in a story before. But at the same time, it was so internalized. It was so ingrained in me that I had to explain my story for, for a, an audience that would not, that would just by default not understand me or by default um, need, you know, need help figuring out some of the things I say in Amharic, even if it's just one word like in Jeddah. Um, 
that that was actually the biggest challenge rejecting that impulse to fall into rebutting the white gaze was probably one of the um most annoying things in the process um that that was a, a really big challenge um and i had to actually create a narrative device to help me with that so i speak to that empress that i brought up earlier empress i2 in the story um in order to basically have someone else to talk to that's not my audience because otherwise it felt like i'm just justifying my experience which i don't want to do i just want it to exist without having to justify it because that's what i do every day now that uh i cannot even count how many new streamers are popping out every single day and even during COVID, now we have i mean at least 15 that i know of that popped out um you know some of the smaller distributors now are actually streamers of their own uh by virtue of the need uh, creating an incredible amount of ab abundance of choice. So there's no doubt, and the, the streamers have created an opportunity to serve the underserved communities a lot more than the theatrical Hollywood model, which depended on global tent poles, right? Um, that might change. We don't know what's going to happen after the pandemic, but uh, that's what it used to be. On the other hand, due to AI powered algorithmic film and episodic curation, the streamers seem to be have now created a programmatic silos and feeding audiences what they are used to watching. So arguably, my argument here is that uh, potentially actually dividing us more, amplifying experiences to different uh, areas. Like my, and this is a question just to discuss, you know, it's, it's not like, it's just a theory, right? But my front page of my Netflix is so different than somebody else, which is great, that's perfect. But um, so does that mean that if we're only focused on one thing or one ideology or one experience, as we continuously go in that extreme, and you know, thinking that as an example, if there's an opposing point of view, something that you disagree with, that person potentially by watching the things that they enjoy uh, are getting further away from understanding you actually. So this is in YouTube, you can see, obviously in our political world, we've seen it actually happen, um, you know, um, the prior president's uh, Twitter account had to be canceled. So uh, we can see that there's a lot of force that's happening through these kinds of like algorithmic curation of thoughts uh, beyond films too. So I guess my question is, how do you feel about these silos? What do you think? Do you think it's helping us? Do you think it's uh, causing potentially new pain points? Are there any things that we can do as content creators while we design our stories to combat that perhaps? Are there educational moments that we can include in our stories that perhaps uh, put a, a certain IP into different catalogs at the same time. This is obviously all hypothetical, but I'm very curious to hear what you guys think about it. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go after elegance first. <laughs> I, I should have expected that. Um, I'm still trying to put the algorithm together of what you're asking, to be honest. Um, <laughs> uh, siloing, uh, I'm not, it's tough, like my, my my feature that I'm in uh, pre-production on is a story. It's called The Inspection. It's about a gay kid who joined, a homeless gay kid who joins the Marine to change his life, but then has to conceal his attraction to his drill instructor in order to survive boot camp. And it's set during the Age of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So the lead character is black, gay. We're in the military, so that's a military film. Um, the Iraq war, I guess, would be another thing that the algorithm would, you know, so in terms of like a solution of like trying to embed, like, you know, he's at boot camp with all of America. So I would hope that I would start to kind of skew across different uh, suggestion lists than what would, would normally be expected by an LGBTQ film, right? Um, in terms of what I do, so that, I guess I do that in my work anyway. Like I, I, I oh, so this kind of back to the other question. Another thing that drives, drives me crazy is films about others that act as if white people don't exist, right? Like, I don't want to say the names of these films because the people who make those films have a lot more money and power than me. But, um, you know, it's like you're in a black town and they never see a white person ever. You're, you know, and it's, to me, it's just, it's odd to think that it almost, it's kind of self-defeatist in a way. It's, it's just, it almost says that we can't have a good life if white people are around. We can't be our best if white people are around. I think there's something in that that could be explored, but these films don't do that. They just get, present 
reality in this kind of like tunnel vision way. And I think that that's dangerous to audience, to black audiences. I think a lot of, I don't know what conversations are being had behind the scenes about expectations of what black people would watch or won't watch or uh, their taste level or, you know, concepts around like homophobia and transphobia. Could you, could you do a black Christmas movie with a trans girl that comes to, you know, could you do that? Would a person who's algorithmically concerned believe that that would be successful? You know, I don't know. I, I really don't know. But I think that um, it's tough because it's a business and it's a show. It's art and it's commerce. So the work to some degree has to make money to justify making more work. And somewhere in that process, things get cooked down to their most non-nuanced and like condensed forms. And I would hope that the people who are the ones getting paid to kind of interpret this like, you know, kind of these bones of the algorithm, I would hope that these individuals are interested in experimenting with the algorithm and perhaps, you know, let's make a Christmas movie about a trans girl who comes home to a Baptist Southern family that Dolly Parton stars in. Let's make that movie and see if everybody watches it. You know, I hope those people are not, you know, sometimes it feels like executives, their best skill is to stay employed. Um, and I would hope that they would want to do more than just be employed going, going forward. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's, it's, in my opinion, politics is a statement. It's a career job, you know, it's the uh, first four years, you go one direction, next uh, eight years, go, you go to another direction, and you're fundraising for it. So no, I, I don't have information as to what happens behind the scenes, you know, and curation, but certainly, you know, it, it's, it's a problem of our time. And none of us have seen what the results of that could be, except that one thing it's true, the world has become a little bit more extremist in every aspect. So, and, and become more extremist. Uh, you know, it's hard for me to, this is a kind of like this whole capital riot thing. Right. Tuskegee, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, white people drop bombs on Tulsa less than a hundred, oh, just a little over a hundred years ago. So are we more extremists? I don't know about that. I think what we are is more informed about all the extremism that's happening at once but do I really believe that Trump is an example of like some sort of like abnormal progression of like white American rage? No, I don't. I, I don't think that at all. I think that this country has been what it is for a long time. Like we watched it, we, we congratulate ourselves on the 60s, but we don't actually think to ourselves, wait, wait, they're spraying hoses on children going to school. They're dogs attacking school children, bombs. People are blowing up churches. This Dylan Roof just did that like, not that long ago, you know? So are we more like, you know, I think, I think, I think if anything, it's like, like even in Rwanda, this happened, right? They would get on the radio and like talk about the other side and then eventually it turned into a genocide, you know? And I just wonder if like the, we, it's always like putting the problem outside of the person. Now it's the algorithm's fault. No, it's the executive. The executive is the person whose job it is to determine who, whose choices can change the algorithm. You can change the algorithm by doing something different. So do I, do I think it's making people more extremists? No, I think people are extremists. The question is, is it making them smarter? Is it making them more empathetic? Is it making them more, more um, willing to collaborate with their neighbor, right? That's the thing, because we already know that America and, and the West is extremist and violent. It has been this way for hundreds of years. But what has not happened is that in all of our innovation, going to space and like, you know, curing COVID and, you know, everything that science and Western medicine can do, they can't seem to create multiple generations of white people who don't want to kill everybody else who's not white. Very true. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe the algorithm could do that. I don't know. Interesting, because like you said earlier, you know, it is a business as well. So, you know, in the end, they're looking at their bottom line. A business does that, you know, otherwise it's not a business. But um, perhaps, you know, it'd be great to have certain checkpoints or systems in place to, to you know, smoothen it a little bit more and make it more humanistic. Is there anyone else who'd like to add on that? The, the silos of experiences or you're not? I mean, I feel like Elegant said it really nicely. And I think... Um... I am trying to, you know, just on a personal like filmmaker level, I try and push myself to create things that won't, that will fall into genres that people will want to watch instead of just um, like a medical story or, 
you know, coming of age is, is often for female filmmakers, a lot of the realm that they go into. And the thing I just shot is like a World War II historical thriller and it deals with disability, which is like that you hope falls into all those different alg algorithm boxes where people may see that in some, you know, if you like World War II, you might like this, you know, or something like that. So um, I, I, I do agree that it's up to those executives to start putting those things in place. And then maybe the algorithm does shoot some random things out there, you know, instead of all the things, the only things that you've been watching. I mean, I, I feel like the algorithm is so screwed up anyways. I'm like, I'm, I'm seeing the same, you know, 20 movies that they're trying to force feed me. And I'm like, I, I want to see everything else that's out there. So those are my thoughts. No, that, those are great thoughts. Uh, democracy isn't perfect, and our country is very divided at this moment. We have a rare opportunity here in this panel with individuals from different walks of life. In your opinion, what is the best way for us all to bridge each other's communities through stories? How can we actually do it? So it's one thing to talk about it. It's one thing to send it to festivals. We know that indie film has a only so far reach if it doesn't get picked up by a large distributor and tons of money is pushed behind it. So what can we do in, I mean, I'm just asking each and every one of you. Um, and if you have any examples that things that you've done, perhaps community screenings or any examples that you might have, uh, you might want to talk about, um, this is the great time for it, so. I'm always trying to grow and learn and, and learn about the intersectionality of disability and how the white experience is usually the one that's shown and, and trying to engage other people or other stories that can show a different experience because it does matter where you're coming from when you come into disability and how people react to it. Um, and that's something that I, I'm, I'm like engaging a lot of the way I find like actors and people because, you know, finding actors with disabilities is always my biggest challenge because it's, they don't get the, um, the time to develop their craft and, and learn and grow because they're not giving these opportunities. And then people say, well, we don't know them and, and are they too green and all these things. So I, you know, a lot of the thing that I do is I go on TikTok and I go on um, Instagram and I go on all these places where there's people who may have something and I'm trying, I'm almost like acting like a casting director at times because I'm like, I want to find the person. And then when I pitch this, it's not like, well, we don't know who's going to play that, you know, and I'm, and I'm pushing myself to really go outside of my experience or what I think, you know, this film should be and, and wonder if we could kind of build it with the person, whoever it would be to cast to know more about them, get to know their experience and, you know, really be able to write something that has more authenticity, you know, just because we both have a disability doesn't mean I'm going to know everything about the rest of their life, you know, especially when we're coming from different places. So I think um, that's something that I just actively have been like trying to do and, and really like just make it front and center and, and realize when I'm, when I'm not doing that. That's great. Uh, I'm a sucker for TikTok as well. And uh, I am an addict of TikTok. I fall asleep watching TikTok. It's very sad, but it's yeah. Part of my you get the guy who goes, you've been scrolling for way too long. That's when you know you're in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. So to me, I think there's a disconnect between the kind of means of production of the creative industries and the audience. I mean, this is just, that's why we're even talking about algorithms. We're always trying to kind of figure out what it is that they want. One of the things that has been most helpful to me is being a volunteer and working in the nonprofit space. I worked for this organization for about a year called RealWorks. They specialize in teaching low to moderate income uh, minorities, uh, people who traditionally are not in the film business, teaching them how to make these are high schoolers. Like, I mean, they do the whole lifespan from like, you know, I think second grade is when they begin all the way through high schooler, high schoolers. But my program was kids who were in high school. And these kids would get internships. They Well, first they'd make their own films within the unit. There's a whole production studio with cameras and computers and everything, but they also get to interact with people in the business. So they're able to kind of do internships. I, I, one of my students was working at HBO as an assistant editor. And, you know, this kid is from like, I think like East Flatbush, which is a black Caribbean community on the outskirts of Brooklyn, of New York, but far away from Manhattan, right? Um, so, that is to say that now this kid is having interactions 
and these, and more importantly, these executives are interacting with this kid. They're able to really understand the impact of the choices they make and to appreciate the power that they wield in how these young people conceive of themselves and the world and their place in it and their ability to change it for the better. So I would encourage those who are watching this to step outside of your office, office offices are over but you know step 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 outside of your own kind of like work life and make yourself available to the next generation and be that bridge be that person that can inspire a young person to come into this business and make positive change because if they if we are not connecting to the audience then the whole thing starts to become you can spin yourself in circles creating a lot of damage when the easiest thing to do is just to reach out and and make someone a part of it be conscious of making new people a part of it. Absolutely, I'm with you. And and the market, the tale is so long, and there just isn't enough uh, space for everyone. That's the truth, and uh, and that's also not being talked about actually uh, in general. You know, everyone wants to get into the best festivals. Everyone wants to get into those programs that only ten people are selected. But what happens to number eleven? That's almost there, and number twelve or number thirteen. That's you know? me. That's <laughs> <laughs> And Real Works is amazing. I've actually also participated with them uh, for a few years, so they're they're a great program. Um, Ainsley, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm pretty new to all of this. I mean, last year was the first year I, you know, released my first project, and I haven't. I've been struggling with, you know, connecting to audiences, um, and yeah, it's been really limited. So, um, I mean, I've just been keeping my eyes open to connecting um, and sharing my story in spaces where maybe I wouldn't necessarily, I don't know, like not maybe outside of the film festival space, like in more academic environments. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been really limited. So I don't think I have a lot more to say about that. But to be honest, what a great start. You know, your, your VR project was everywhere. You know, it's it's in all the great places. So congrats on that. And Thank you. Just even just by virtue of being there, I think it provides an example uh, to a lot of people. So each of you, as far as I know, are self-made, and I tried to research as much as possible. Um, but there are a lot of filmmakers and creators out there that seem to be expecting a, some sort of support from out, from an outside force to help them lift up, right? There's this mentality. I, I've met, as a producer, I'm meeting so many filmmakers and, and I see, you know, everybody talking, I need an agent, I need more funding, I need to, yes, we all need that for sure. But it's a, you know, it's, we have access, like Ainsley, for example, you know, she she didn't have access to do a full big uh, you know feature unless I'm mistaken you know then you went no that's right that's right <laughs> found your way so you got really creative with what you wanted to do and and that's that's the part that 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 I think is very important you know it's we can't ex expect others to help us all the time so for anyone that's out there uh, and we do need help don't get me wrong you know we, everybody needs support there's no doubt about that but it's it that's a mentality that you can be in a cycle forever and so. <clears throat> for people that are listening that are maybe more in the beginning of their career and they're trying to figure it out, you know, what do you, what would you like to tell them? And like, what are the tools that you think uh, they can use to, you know, bypass some of these like checkpoints and, 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 you know, we see YouTube videos all the time that receive 5 million views, you know, and then, and then something happens from there. So it's like many independent films don't get 5 million views. So it's like, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a really interesting situation. So I'm just curious, like, Maybe you can give any uh, advice or comment to any young filmmaker, how to find a mentor or, you know, what they can do um, if you have any ideas. I have some ideas. Sorry? Um, I think, you know, for me, it was someone told me the only people who really don't make it in this industry are the ones who give up too soon, which is a very, it can be a dangerous <laughs> thing. You, you need to like figure out your taste and make sure, you know, there is something um there that you can work with but I think that is true I mean I'm I'm 33 and I've been working in the industry now I counted yesterday for 12 years a lot of that was getting coffee for people and printing off scripts and picking up dry cleaning and I got to know a ton of these people which I don't think it should take this long but you know I'm finally in this place where like 
those people that I worked for are now giving me jobs and hiring me for things. And like, that was a long time to, to see it through, but it is paying off. And kind of that thing that that person told me a long time ago was like, okay, I am sticking around. I'm pushing forward. I'm continuing to make things, which is really important, whether it's writing, making shorts, you know, showing things to people saying, here is my voice. Here's what I have to share. You know, my first short was self-funded for like $500. You know, I just saved up money and then I asked a, for a lot of favors. And I mean, some people will say no. I've had people turn me down. And then some people will say yes. And, you know, I've I've done so many of those random emails to people of like, hi, my name's Ashley. I'm an aspiring filmmaker. Would you talk to me? And so many people say no or they don't respond. But there are those few people who do along the way, you know, and you have to use grace and know when you're really like annoying someone. But I think it's like, keep kind of pushing and finding those people that will, you know, be allies for you. And I've had random people doing it to me recently. And I'm like, this is so funny where it's now, you know, I get a random email of someone who is like, I've been researching you. And, you know, you're like, oh, this is nice, you know, and to have like, you know, a 30, 45 minute Zoom conversation with them and pass along some tips, hear about them. Like, I'm happy to do that because I've had people do that for me. You know, and I think it's, it's really not waiting for the money to come or start crowdfunding funding like I did both of my two shorts through crowdfunding and yeah most of the donations are like $30 but you know 400 people ended up donating because I did such a like heavy campaign really research talked to a lot of people about how to do it who've done it in the past and you know I think I think you can keep building yourself and showing that you know it, it's the people who are like I have my short and I haven't shot it in you know seven years and you're you're like it's a short, you know, like write something smaller than and shoot that, you know, and people who are waiting for that check of, you know, 50 K to go shoot their thing or whatever. It's like, you just, you don't need it. And you got to put that you're putting energy for it. And then people will want to help you. That was really absolutely right. Um, I think the other thing to remember too, is uh, I've been fortunate in that my husband and creative partner, Chester, like we kind of came into this together and I think surrounding yourself with positive energy is really important. People who believe in you when you don't believe in yourself and when you don't believe in yourself, figuring out how to believe in yourself. And I think what Ashley says is absolutely right, but it's absolutely right. You have to give yourself a reason to believe in yourself. So you make the things that you can make. If you don't have the money to make a, a movie, write a script, write a, a, a spec script, you know, do something every day to move forward. And I think the most important thing I could say is like, that someone told me and it turns me true, it takes 10 years to change your life. Like nothing is gonna happen overnight. Every victory counts. There are so many more festivals than Sundance, South by Toronto, Cannes, you know, and, that's, and we love these festivals, but I've played a couple of these festivals, never South by, but that's a different, that's a different Zoom. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that People get caught up in this idea, well, if my movie doesn't go to Sundance and I don't get the Sundance Lab and then I don't get the Director's Lab and then now I'll never make my first film. And, and the reality is most of the movies that play Sundance don't come through those labs. Most of the, the filmmakers that you love did not make it in that cookie cutter way that you're imagining is your way to make it. So you have to embrace the process and understand that this could take some time, but every laurel you get counts. You know, even if it's like, you know, they, people say first tier, second tier, third tier, whatever. I have played so many LGBTQ festivals, so many black film festivals, you know, and they've, each time I've played one, I've walked away with someone who's become a believer and an advocate for my work. And it has gotten me into the position that I'm in now. So, you know, don't get caught up in the laurels of things get caught up in the work of things and celebrate the victories and learn from the defeats and it'll eventually happen. Knowing and identifying what your limitations are and what your restrictions are, and then figuring out how to turn them into advantages, um, which is, you know, that's what I ended up doing. Um, and it worked out great for me. And, you know, it, it can, I think, lead to more creative solutions or more creative perspectives or more unique angles um, for approaching something, you know, that maybe wouldn't have been so obvious to you um, the first time you thought about it. Sometimes it seems like 
you don't have a whole bunch of references that are, um, uh, you know, that are going to help you think about your project in another way. At least I, I felt like that, you know, and not just because it was a VR experience, but, um, you know, the, the subject matter, um, the Ethiopian American experience, the restaurant experience, the Cleveland experience, the, all these different, the, the different layers of experience. Um, and I think it's okay. You should know that it's okay to look beyond the medium that you're working with for a reference. Like I'm really inspired by this painter. Um, I'm just gonna say N.G. Deka Akugili Crosby, this Nigerian uh, American painter who, I mean, I, I feel like I copied her work, but I didn't, but I, to me that reference was so powerful that, you know, it, it really helped. And so I think, you know, music or, are different types of mediums can be can be really valuable references, even though maybe in your environment, people around you might not see that. I think you should be okay with that. That's amazing. Um, I will have one more go around, and this is a very short one. It's just about um, outside of your work. Um, are there any books or filmmakers or uh, you know uh, songwriters that you're inspired by that you'd like to share? Because um, for me, like I said, if 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 IPs are manuals on how to function in life, it tells me a lot about a person. I know it's hard to pigeonhole things, but not to elevate the situation more, but uh, if, if you guys want to share anything, uh, feel free to do it. If, if, if not, that's fine too, you know. I caught you off guard, I'm aware, so. I, it's always, this, when this question comes up, it's like, if, if I wasn't on this call, I'd be in them right now. <laughs> now I have to, a question, I can't even think about it. Um, I think, like I, like I said, uh, in terms of books, I think I think the Souls of Black Folk on Orientalism by Ed, Souls of Black Folk by W. B. Du Bois uh, on on Orientalism by Edward Said, um, and I'm trying to think of what else would I say you have to read. Those are the two things. That, oh oh, uh, Black Skin White Mass by Frantz Fanon. Those are three books that I think if you're wanting to understand something about intersectionality and historical oppression that could inform how you approach the, the, the arts, the kind of mass, mass cultural arts. I think those are books that I wish more people in Hollywood had experience with. And because when I read those books, those books absolutely changed the way I interacted with the world as a human being. And I would hope that everybody in Hollywood especially those who wear the blue suits, read those books. If we're gonna talk about music, um, <laughs> everybody should listen to Ethiopian jazz. It's really good. It's, um, you know, I, I feel like Ethiopian jazz is home for me. Um, so anyways, yeah, Ethiopics album series. But um, I don't know, in, in terms of reading, uh, recently, I've been reading Survivance by Gerald Visner, which is about um, basically like a lot of the things we're talking about, um, figuring out strategies for storytelling that are liberatory or emancipatory. Um, and he writes, he's a Native American scholar. From a disability perspective, I'm very inspired by Frida Kahlo because I love how she takes the elements of disability and pain and, and her poetry and her art and everything. I put it in one of my second short films, like a recreation of one of her paintings into a dance, which was super fun just because I think she, ex it's almost a catharsis for her. And that's what I felt a lot of, you know, making films and writing and art has been for me. It takes the pain of like having over 30 surgeries, a different type of body, you know, going through all these things and putting it into something that I feel is like a beautiful creation. And I think that's sh what she did as well. Um, and another book I love is, um, this is just one about like kind of the um, procrastination of being an artist. I procrastinate, procrastinate a ton in the beginning of my career. Now that I'm actually, um, you know, figured out my process and how to work, it's way better. And it won't always feel like that, at least for me. Um, but The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield is is really just something that kind of like kicks you in the ass and is like, all right. He's like, you're avoiding doing your art by reading this book, aren't you? Like that's the first sentence. And you're like, I am. So it's just a kind of a very real raw way to like do the work. And I think that's the biggest um, thing that has, has helped me. 
Now, I also want to throw out there on TV, if you guys haven't seen La Veneno, please watch it. It is an amazing work of, of hybrid filmmaking that I think is just, it's, it's just so good. It's so good. It makes me so happy about taking this next step forward in trans representation in mainstream media. I love it dearly. Yeah. And I like Lindsay Lohan's music sometimes. I, don't know. I like stupid <laughs> things too. I, I, I watch so much stupid stuff. I watch, it's okay to be stupid sometimes. Definitely. I, I'm stupid every time. So it's, it's totally, I get it. You know? No, but this is awesome. So we just curated these amazing stories for people that are listening. And uh, thank you for doing that. You know, these are great options for a lot of people now. So I just wanted to thank all of you for your time. And thanks everyone who signed in uh, to watch our panel. Um, hopefully you enjoyed it and it was you know, worth, worthwhile for you. And uh, for the next year ahead of us in uh, the remaining part of 2021 and 2022, we hope that the pandemic ends very quickly and then uh, we can have these panels more in person. Thank you so much for everyone's time and especially to, to my guests, Elegance, Ashley and Ainsley. Thank you very much. You're my idols. Uh, oh. Hope I can be like you guys one day, you know, so. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye.